So as we change gears here, I want to dig deep into MinIO and Kubernetes, right? It's an incredibly important part of what it is that we do. And if you were to uh, ask me to sort of uh, think back about what has been the most surprising about Kubernetes rise, I would tell you it's probably the suddenness of it. Um, it was over in a technology nanosecond. There was no drawn out VHS and Betamax discussion there. Uh, it happened really, really quickly. Um, and that was good for the entire industry and has really made it the un, uh, undisputed standard when it comes to thinking about compute and infrastructure. Kubernetes obviously is a very key part of our success. Um, and I think one of the reasons that Kubernetes has been successful, it falls into kind of these three categories and it relates to MinIO specifically. So one is, um, you know, immediately Kubernetes basically imparted billions of dollars of intellectual property um, to the rest of the world. Um, and they did so in a really short time. And a startup in Sweden understood the scaling secrets of Google, right? A system integrator in Australia understood how Amazon did automation. Um, it wasn't always simple, but it was all there. And so that ability to impart all that uh, hyperscaler wisdom to the rest of the community um, was remarkable. And second of all, the technology just fundamentally was superior um, in abstracting the infrastructure that, that lie beneath it. Um, that was particularly important for us at MinIO because the edge component of that, whether you're looking at K3s or micro K8s, um, it doesn't matter because we operate uh, a lot at the edge because uh, we're only 50 MB from, a, from a, a binary perspective. And it was just simply better at managing those things that, that are important, right? Resiliency, scalability, continuity, and so forth. And I think the last point here, and perhaps one of the most important, is that open source, like MinIO, was a critical component of Kubernetes success. It allowed a community to be built very, very quickly, but more importantly, for successful companies to be built inside of that community very, very quickly. It has a self-sustaining ecosystem, one that the AI community can really only dream of at this point. And so that became hey, the standard. Um, hey, Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of a, unusual to hear about object storage at the edge. Yeah, it's it's not something you would consider. Um, I mean, I could object storage. I'm thinking about petabytes or, or you know, beyond uh, storage lakes and data lakes. But the edge uses the object storage. So there are three cases like we are seeing initial pull. Uh, one is coming from the telco side because they are actually producing a lot of data at the edge and uh, they are actually deploying complete stack. The early on you saw they adopted OpenStack. They were full compute infrastructure at the edge. And then now they're uh, they are all moving towards Kubernetes, but they actually have a full stack at the, at the edge. And for them to put the data on a public cloud when the compute is at the edge, the data going to public cloud, the ingress egress charges are even more expensive than storage charges. So they are actually wanting to keep the object storage at the edge. And a lot of it is machine generated data like log data, uh, media content, like it's just growing really fast. There's the two other categories. Uh, one is all the IoT industrial type machine generated data. They actually have to have at the age two. Then the third one, it's also loosely connected to the other two, is the automobile autonomous driving. Even uh, We even have a customer who actually has drones flying aisle to aisle in a warehouse and scanning all the barcodes. They come park themselves, dump the data to MinIO. And then all the processing happens at the edge. And then it goes, the, the finished data goes to a centralized data repository, which could be MinIO or Amazon S3 or one of the public cloud players. Even the, the autonomous driving, they actually produce, that's very known, well-known fact that they produce tons of data. And the edges themselves actually have grown to petabytes and uh, they process all the raw data and then the filtered data goes to the public cloud. Edges with a petabyte of storage? I mean, we're talking a, a, a tank or what? <laughs> the containers, the real physical containers. All right, thanks. <laughs> Maybe you mentioned more than once uh, edge use cases. Is it becoming a real opportunity for, for MinIO? I mean, uh, last time we, we spoke, it was just, uh, you know, on the horizon, but actually we didn't talk a lot about uh, edge, but you mentioned it twice or thrice already today. It yeah, in, in our case, it's it's for us. We don't want to drive. It's very hard to change the, the, the for a small, for a single company to change the direction of the industry, right? The way we do is watch the industry, build a product, listen to the signals, and grow 
with the industry. Uh, the signals from the edge are actually really coming from paying customers. Right? When they, they have been using Minivo for a while, and uh, when when the data started growing fast, they uh, they started reaching out to us. But the edge opportunities more and more are even looking like OEMs. These are like say for example uh, the, the telco providers. I, I don't know if I can name them have the permission, but the, the major telco providers, these are companies who build the software stack for the telcos and they have bundled Minio into their stack and that's getting deployed by the telcos across the world and they need an OEM uh, license from Minio. So we, we started seeing a pattern in our customer base and uh, now from our point of view, I'm not really differentiating private cloud versus edge. Uh, end of the day, for me, if there is data, I want to be there. Uh, but uh, but I do see that uh, edge is beginning to grow. Uh, uh, I, uh, I think that, uh, like more than even where we are today, I think the 5G will uh, will create a new class of applications. More and more data will be produced outside of the public cloud. And even when we started, we always knew that bulk of the world's data is going to be produced outside of Amazon S3. And what are they going to do? They're not going to put on file and block. They will want the rest of the world to look like AWS. And our worldview was, okay, we are not going to boil the ocean. We will solve one piece of that problem that is object storage. When you are outside Amazon AWS, if you want S3, we need it to be there. So we were basically growing everywhere uh, that there was data. And we are now seeing that uh, that edge is actually a, a real case. I would at least say in the autonomous space, uh, autonomous driving space, the machine generated data, that's basically industrial IoT and telco are three places I would categorize them under edge. Uh, so a follow up questions uh, about uh, hedge or in general, th these use cases. So do you see adoption also for uh, ARM in production, ARM CPUs? Be because you know you have this this distribution of your solution yeah. since day one, and yeah, yeah, I knew that I was it was on raspberries, but never in you know thought about it in production. Exactly right. Uh, so uh, the the all those uh, the ARM uh, port of Minivo really had nothing to do with the edge at all. Right. In fact, what I'm seeing at the edge is all AMD sixty four or x eighty six sixty four. Right. It's just a standard Intel architecture. It, the, uh, the the ARM board was just purely hobbyist, and as if you have an open source open source product, you have the responsibility to be portable. From IBM Power architecture to uh, ARM architecture, we ported, and the the home NAS appliance like QNAP, Synology, all the way to. Uh, the Raspberry Pis, we knew there is no money at all, but these hobbyists are also the evangelists who bring change inside their organization. So we took them seriously and then we gave them the port. And uh, the next thing we are seeing, the 5G towers are running ARM version of Minivo inside, the, inside, those, uh, inside those towers, but still we, we didn't see ARM as a strategy to get into the edge. I think edge today, I would say it's all still standard x86 architecture. But where we see a promise for ARM is actually in the server business itself. You saw that how Amazon's Graviton 2, Minivo's benchmark shows that a single socket multi dense core, dense multi core CPU actually is better than a dual socket, uh, typical Intel architecture. And uh, it, it's beating Intel architecture in terms of the sheer performance. And uh, even if you leave out the power uh, 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 consumption, just purely on performance, it's faster. And we actually see a promise uh, uh, in terms of the server boxes. The only problem is when will I see a supermicro server, a Quanta server, Dell server with ARM based? I think it's a matter of time, but today is still not there. So Abe, why don't you take us a little bit through um, just the architecture quickly um, around legacy object storage and then how we've uh, how it works with Minio. Yeah. So uh, this is specific to Kubernetes, but the idea is common in, when you enter into the cloud native world. The very advantage uh, of cloud native world is also its disadvantage. That is, cloud native world is about leaving the legacy ideas, legacy architecture and compatibility, APIs, everything behind, and you go back to the drawing board, do a clean design, and when it is cloud native, you get the full advantage of the cloud native architecture. That is scale, automation, everything that Jonathan explained. But then that comes with the drawback that you, you, everything else you have in your infrastructure cannot be retrofitted into the new environment. Right here, if you see what is frowned upon in the cloud native ecosystem, like specific to Kubernetes, 
everything in kubernetes has to be a container managed provisioned orchest managed that is full orchestration it has to be managed by kubernetes if a part of your stack is running on bare metal or on object or on a hardware appliance it is not managed by kubernetes the software that is running inside an appliance or on bare metal if when it is not managed by kubernetes you basically lost the advantage of kubernetes kubernetes requires every every piece of software in your infrastructure to be running inside a container and it presents itself as a kubernetes object that is when the kubernetes framework can deal with all those objects in a universal way and treating them as a kubernetes object means you can apply apis and uh, you can do updates upgrade all the benefits right now here the appliance part that when you when you bring a traditional object storage out there it is very much like you have your application stack uh, but your database your data store is outside of kubernetes that is a problem and when you when you containerize it when you contain when you containerize the the data store it is very it's not very different right if you are looking at object storage the running object storage or cassandra or or elastic or splunk any one of those data stores are just running the same way as your application containers the the only difference is your application containers are stateless and the 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 data store containers are stateful somewhere someone has to store the states and all the stateless containers which is the preferred cloud native design the states come to the data store and here minivo's case minivo holds the blob data and the databases store the metadata eventually metadata the databases themselves write the the accumulated snapshots or the indexed blobs they call table segments back into minivo so minivo becomes the single persistent data store uh, the system of truth system of record for the infrastructure now here what you see uh, in this picture is minivo itself running as a software container and the containers have an operator that is minivo operator it's actually part of kubernetes standard design and the kubernetes operator manages minivo's tenant what does this give you it gives you amazon like self service capability as new applications get rolled out new tenants get created and every tenant how you upgrade them how you scale them uh, and restart all those management is applied and managed the same way your as your application containers anyone in your in anyone who knows kubernetes knows how to manage the application stack as well as the data stack all the same way the result is now you can roll out your software stack in minutes on physical uh, like say uh, on a private cloud or a edge cloud or any of these public cloud in you can roll out in minutes and take the advantage right that is really what the industry is looking for Jonathan. so i think one of the reasons that we've been successful in the kubernetes space is that we really came to this honestly right um, we were built in the last five years Kubernetes was already a big thing um, when we came out. It wasn't completely evident that they would roll over Meso Mesosphere and others the way they did. Um, but we were built natively for those RESTful APIs. We weren't ever tinkering with the legacy POSIX uh, stuff. Um, and it doesn't require drivers or connectors. We just work in that environment. It's natural to us. And that's why developers have adopted us in droves um, for those types of use cases. We're also, and I can say this with some comfort, we're uh, at the forefront of S3 compatibility. Um, you know, S3 is the de facto standard for object storage. Um, we've always been on the forefront of that from a compatibility standpoint. We were one of the first ones to market with V4. We're one of the handful of ones that support things like S3 select um, predicate pushdown, um, which is a very complicated uh, implementation. And we were strictly consistent from inception. Um, and that's something that we like to point out since uh, Amazon just recently came, came around to that, that point of view, but I think that's incredibly important as well. And the result of that is that we are, it is our default. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Um, Jonathan, you, you, uh, MinIO has been consistent from the start. I mean, no other object storage to my knowledge other than some of the, you know, the, the on-prem stuff is consistent. S3 was never consistent up until the latest time and none of the other object storages uh, even talk about consistency. That is fairly accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so, we, uh, we were strictly consistent and there is actually no caching in Minaio. Every operation, even from the drives, like the, the operating system can cache data, the controllers can cache data. Every read and write is O direct. That's basically a DMA operation. And uh, all operations are atomically committed or not. The reason for us why we chose this approach was really everything in Minaio was designed for operational simplicity. If I told you, hey, I took care of it and I failed, I have no way of letting you know you are application, you as the application or the application owner. Now that becomes an operational problem and it's a nightmare to deal with such failures. So that's why we took this approach very early on that correctness is even more important than performance. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Um, the result of this is that our default deployment scenario at this point has become uh, basically Kubernetes. Um, you know, 62% of our um, instances are containerized, 43% of those are managed via Kubernetes. And so that um, continues to grow. We have a very long tail on that. Um, and that's consistent with the highest levels that you're seeing in the industry. And so we're very comfortable that what we've done uh, has allowed our customer base and our developer base to rapidly adopt uh, Kubernetes for object storage. Um, and that's become and will continue to grow um, in terms of our, uh, our deployment scenarios. Now, the, what we've done on the Kubernetes front has actually created a tremendous amount of pressure on our competitors. Uh, and we're going to talk about the pressure that we're applying to them across a number of different dimensions. But in the uh, Kubernetes space in particular, um, it's uh, it's been very evident, right? So Pure Storage went out and bought Portworks, right? That was a direct response to um, our leadership in this area, uh, particularly within the object storage space. They do a lot of different things, but in the object storage space in particular. Uh, it's also interesting to note their Pure as a service looks a lot like MinIO's subnet service, which we launched, um, you know, again, uh, over a year ago. Dell EMC has gone back and, uh, you know, from scratch is trying to rebuild an object storage system that is actually cloud native um, and that isn't being ported over from a, from a legacy system. Um, they announced that in September alongside the VMware uh, announcement. Uh, they haven't released that code yet. We're, uh, we're expecting they will at some point. But again, there's an organization that basically went and scrapped what it is that they were doing to try to compete more effectively with what it is that we're doing. And you see that on NetApp side as well. So not only in terms of the cloud initiatives that they're doing, but they're trying to reposition their object store, uh, storage grid um, piece of this um, around high performance, right? And that's a function of the fact that we have delivered that high performance benchmark out there. Uh, we've delivered a shot across the bow from an industry perspective on this is what it means, means to be a high performance object store. It's not just a marketing term. Uh, and I think on a general basis, if you think about where we were a year ago, people were just starting to talk about this concept of high performance object storage. Now it's table stakes, right? And we take great pride in that because it allows us to continue to, to raise the bar and to get these much larger competitors to come play on our turf. And we think that's uh, in and of itself um, a, a, great, uh, a great story there. Yeah, so you brought up high performance a couple of times. I mean, you provide a, a highly scalable, you know, quote unquote, performing software framework, but in, in the end, it does run on particular hardware, right? So I've been working with Object Store for a while and in the old days, it was always spindles. Do you have an idea what your customers are running on? I mean, are, are people building Minio on top of NVMe drives, for example, or, or do you see still a, a, a larger portion of your customer base dealing with large, large amount of spindles and kind of, kind of spread the performance around as opposed to concentrate it into a smaller amount of devices? I would tell you that it depends on industry and it depends on workload. Um, you know, the finance industry um, has moved very rapidly to NVMe and SSD. Um, healthcare, um, similarly. Um, and again, again, the, the, anywhere that we're seeing uh, ML and AI pipeline workloads, those are generally uh, finding themselves on the NVMe, uh, again, because they're looking for that additional performance from a read and write perspective. Um, so, um, I, again, it'll depend a little bit, certainly on the autonomous side where everything's at the edge, those, those are all uh, SSDs, um, but it will depend. Um, it depends on the workload. AB, do you want to add anything to that? 
Yeah, no, you were spot on. Uh, the only uh, only point I, 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 I can add is the large volume, like five petabyte plus, right? When I mean, you are looking at five to 100 petabyte type range, like still hard drives are hard to beat. And at that point, bulk of your data is anyway kind of a warm store. And hard drives are actually quite okay when it comes to throughput performance. If you are looking for IOPS style performance, that is still like small small files as a primary store, uh, because the SSDs are significantly faster, right? multiple multiple times faster than hard drives. The primary storage market is basically moving towards all flash. But the, if you are looking at five petabyte to hundred petabyte range, it still hard drives gives the best economics. And it's not like hard drives are that slow, but at that range, you are also looking at purely throughput workloads and hard drives as JBODs are just fine. Right, yeah. thank you. Yeah, uh, I think another bit of evidence uh, here in our Kubernetes um, journey and Kubernetes dominance is that when VMware went to go select design partners for its first generation data persistence platform product, which is basically a core component of Tanzu, um, is they, they picked MinIO, right? And they picked MinIO because they knew that if they could get us working out of the box, um, and they could make the changes on their end for MinIO to work, that almost every application that MinIO is associated with, all those hundreds of thousands of applications um, that we talked about earlier um, in the cloud native space would also run on VMware. And so it was a natural selection from them. They also made some accommodations specifically for us to allow us to run at MinIO speed because they knew that if they could get us to run at MinIO speed, that they would pick up all those workloads that were generally outside of the, the, the standard uh, portfolio of, uh, of things that, that object storage did. So you could pick up the AIML workloads, you could pick up the analytics workloads, you could pick up the modern uh, web application workloads. And so they made those accommodations for us to let us control erasure coding, to let us have direct access to the disks, to let us control um, security elements and things like that. So that was a big uh, accommodation that they made for us uh, in this based on our Kubernetes uh, chops. We also took a lot from them and we don't wanna suggest uh, that we didn't, right? Their operational knowledge is it's so extensive, right? They, you know, the enterprise and the private cloud, that is their, their bailiwick. Um, and so they, we collaborated with them to kind of learn a lot about things such as enter maintenance mode and evacuate nodes to, to really kind of learn from that, that pedigree. And we're gonna go into uh, VMware in considerably more detail here in the next section, um, but it's a huge feather in our cap and really does speak to the fact that when you look at who's leading the way in Kubernetes object storage, uh, MinIO is right at the top of that list. So listen, before we leave this section, I wanna give you kind of three takeaways. So one is, you know, Kubernetes success is modern object storage success, right? Kubernetes has chosen object storage uh, as its uh, as its key um, uh, storage class, um, and that's pretty evident across the across the cloud, across the private cloud, um, wherever you want to look, the Kubernetes distros, and that success is MinIO's success, right? Um, and so we are going along with that. So where Kubernetes wins, we win, and I think that's a huge takeaway. We're putting tremendous pressure on our on the vendor community, and it's a terrible place for them to be, right? If you're trying to catch up and port your software in a world that's moving as fast as it is today, you're in deep trouble, right? They are in full react mode and it's difficult, it's time consuming, it's risky, and it's inherently very, very expensive. And we love that part of it, right? And then finally, I think I would say that the cloud native ecosystem is consolidating around MinIO. Again, I challenge you to type in your favorite cloud native application, the word MinIO, and you're going to find a whole page, 10 pages, of stuff written about how those things go together from our vast and very, very active community. Cloud native applications require cloud native storage and that's what we're delivering today through Kubernetes. I have no doubt about, about your success. You're showing us all the numbers. We, we work together in the past and everything. So my, my, my question is about, you know, many, uh object storage users especially you know the not the larger ones they they, they tend to spend as less as they can on, on object storage i mean dollar per gigabyte is everything and if you can't avoid to pay you know the 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 vendor the storage vendor it it uh it has an impact on the you know cost of the solution at the end of the day so do, do you think that uh, 
you know, uh, especially when compared to Ceph, for example, which is another open source. Now, uh, I, I met many people working with Ceph and then finding that you know, it was too complex. It was like uh, one petabyte uh, per season mean, th stories like that, okay? So how much of the success is the simplicity of the solution? And how much, you know, the uh, part of the success is the fact that it's free, free as in um, So I think, uh, let me answer those in, in two parts. So one is simplicity, I, I, as we stated, is a huge driver of our success, particularly, uh, you know, as it relates to Ceph. But I would also say that Ceph uh, wrote a blog post yesterday, which indicated that their new project, Crimson, they're rewriting the whole thing from scratch. It won't be out till 2022, but they decided that they had to be far more performant than they were today. You can think why they had to be far more performant, right? It's because of MinIO, right? The second piece of it is open source is not a business model for us. Open source is an acquisition, a customer acquisition approach, right? The fact that we don't make you give us your email address to see anything on our website, to download our code, the fact that it's not open core has allowed organizations to adopt us in ways that they never would have otherwise. And again, everywhere we are, our competitor is not. And we can afford to be patient. We're already generating um, very, very big numbers from very, very big clients today from a revenue perspective. We can afford to be patient. They're all going to get there as they put their products into production, right? They can't afford to lose data. They can't afford to have a data breach. They can't afford to have a license violation, right? MinIO is licensed under Apache v2, but also AGPL v3. And all of the Kubernetes code is under AGPL v3. And on a go forward basis, enterprises do not want to have AGPL through v3 exposure in their systems. And so they're coming on board and they're basically becoming commercial customers because of the benefits that come with subnet, but also they want to be compliant from a license perspective. And so we can be patient, um, but we have um, we have taken this as a as a marketing approach from an open source perspective. Sure, it's built into us philosophically. That's why we're 100 percent open source and not open core. Um, but that's why uh, we think we're going to win this.